Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen, and um, I'm going to present uh, like a, a little bit of uh, some work that I've been doing for the last uh, couple of years, actually. Um, and and this is sort of a, uh, an add-on to uh, prior work where we explore some visualization of channel activity levels, EQ. EQ is maybe a big word, but some frequency content especially for user interfaces that implement what we call the uh, stage metaphor that probably some of you have heard about. Uh, I'll just be uh, uh, outlining what the stage metaphor is for those of you who don't know that, and then uh, talk a little bit about the need for visualization, what strategies we came up with, and a, a very informal uh, evaluation that we made sort of as a pilot study you know, to get started on this. So basically, the stage metaphor for mixing takes this. Uh, well, here we have the uh, traditional uh, metaphor, uh, where when you want to set uh, levels and pan, you have uh, sliders and knobs, like on a traditional uh, uh, mixer. Uh, the stage metaphor uh, sort of has each channel as a widget that has a position in a virtual space, in a virtual 2D space. And the position relative to a virtual listening point determines how it's panned either to the right or to the left, uh, or the distance from the listening point determines the volume. So the further away, uh, the lower the volume. Uh, the idea is that this space kind of maps to how many would think about uh, a, a multi-track uh, mix. Um, uh, yeah, and you can even uh, like add extra stuff to distance, for instance, uh, reverb the further away uh, uh, channels get to simulate what would happen in the real world as well. Um, yeah, so this is uh, by f uh, this is not a new concept at all. Uh, a, f a few um, a few related works there. I I wasn't able to get online this morning, so I couldn't. But there are beginning to get more and more. Uh, um, uh, or you're saying non-academia versions of this, which is interesting. So Clang is, is one, uh, one thing there. This is the basic setup that we have been using. Uh, so a virtual listening position uh, down here, and then you move around uh, channels here. And as you can see, it works pretty well when you don't have too many, when you don't have too many channels, but, uh, but there are some issues when, when you begin to, uh, to rise in, in channels. So, uh, just a couple of uh, quick benefits of this uh, metaphor. Um, uh, it's um, potentially closer to the mental model of the user. Now the question is, is it the user from the 70s that uh, Pardo was talking about, or, uh, or is it the guitarist? So probably closer to the guitarist, right? Um, uh, there's uh, some evidence that um, this metaphor can improve some visual search. Uh, while also improving critical listening, which means that it doesn't um, it doesn't overburden uh, the user in terms of taking away some visual information, so you forget to listen. Right? There's uh, uh, something about uh, uh, yeah, so it might be preferred in different uh, contexts. Uh, there's also some interesting uh, research that points towards integral controls in general being uh, uh, faster and more accurate. Uh, especially once you get uh, used to uh, practicing with them, which means that, uh, so, so this is an integral controller because you're essentially when you move something, you're moving two things at the same time. You're controlling two parameters at the same time. Uh, while with a, a, a slider and a knob, you have separate controls. So, uh, so essentially it takes longer time. Uh, and there are certain uh, challenges and more challenges than these, but uh, there's, uh, the, the problem with clutter, and then this, there's no established methods for monitoring, so something like VU monitoring. Uh, and essentially, some of our prior studies show that it's difficult to just know what's, what's playing at, at any given uh, moment in time, and that is uh, sort of the starting point. So that was a long introduction to what, what we're doing. Okay. So I just whiz through this. Um, many different goals when visualizing uh, audio or music in general. There could be uh, the goal of getting some detailed information uh, for d diagnostic uh, reasons. Uh, 
uh, you might want to have an overview of some kind of structure of, of a musical piece, what patterns uh, 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 might be repeating, uh, things like that. Uh, you might want to have something that uh, helps you discover some, uh, not some flaws, but maybe uh, places where you can improve as a musician, for instance. Uh, that, uh, that can be uh, difficult to, to uh, listen carefully to while practicing, for instance. There are uh, maybe the goal of improving uh, the overall aesthetics of the, uh, uh, of the experience. Uh, overview of tonal progression. Uh, maybe you want some kind of summary of a piece or a production of some sort. Uh, you might even want to visualize genre. Um, now, the goals for the goals for our uh, visualization here were that uh, they should definitely not be used in details and not for diagnostics, but uh, be used at a glance. Uh, we wanted to conform to this circular style that uh, most. Uh, most of these widgets have in, when, when we see them being implemented in this stage metaphor. Uh, as little distraction as possible, uh, because you might be working on one track uh, when, uh, when mixing, and then you don't want all of a sudden to be uh, distracted by something visualized on a different track uh, at the same time. Uh, simplicity, intuitiveness, whatever that is, but yeah. Uh, and then some kind of perceptual correlation with uh, with the audio. And we went for visualizing three features. So one feature is just, uh, well, it is more or less loudness, but we wanted to more explicitly tell the user whether the track or the channel is active or not. So something that you would normally see on a VU meter when the VU meter just is not showing you anything. Or if you go to a waveform uh, view of your many channels, then you would see, ah, there's no waveform here. So we don't have that in this, uh, uh, in this setup. Um, then uh, overall loudness, kind of like a VU meter, and then some kind of frequency content. And uh, we went for spectral centroid for this uh, pilot, uh, pilot here. So in terms of activity, uh, ah, a little difficult to see, but maybe you can see that the but there are some that are a little more highlighted than the others. So the idea is that when channels are not playing, they kind of dim down. When they are playing, they dim up. Uh, so, um, so if you were to see the curve, it, just when they start playing, they would dim up immediately. But when they stop playing, then there would be sort of a fall off of three, four seconds, something like that, to not have too much going on at the same time. Uh, then we tried uh, different uh, visualizations of levels. So uh, over here, you might be able to see size uh, as the first one. So uh, more loud, uh, larger size. Uh, then we had this uh, partial ring that uh, sort of travels all the way around the widget. Uh, if it goes all the way around, it sort of hits uh, peak level. And then the, the length of this ring would be somewhere in between. And then we tried with uh, the brightness of, uh, of the channel here. Uh, yeah. Then we have the frequency content. Also, we experimented with the brightness. Uh, so, that, so the higher the spectral centroid, the, the higher the brightness. And then we have these, which uh, maybe you can see them. There's an outline. Uh, an outline here that we induce with noise, and the higher the spectral frequency, the more noisy this uh, outline is. If it's a really low spectral centroid, it's just a, a flat line uh, all around. And kind of the same induced line, but we fill out everything, so uh, it's more sort of the edge of the, uh, of the widget that, uh, that gets distorted, uh, the higher the spectral centroid. And actually, uh, these two also have mappings to levels. So the, the, um, uh, the radius of the outline and the, uh, the size of the widget also changes uh, here. And the reason that we made these uh, variation was that we wanted to just throw them at some 
uh, participants and get a feel for what works in different, uh, uh, so which, which, which variations work and why, why not. Uh, so a couple of demos here. Um, And this is, uh, so this is the, the one without any visualization. And, um, and, and this was kind of what started us out, that, uh, that participants that would try this, they would say that the, I have no idea what is playing at what, what time. So this is, uh, just to give you a feel for, I've, I just chose some of them. This is size uh, or loudness map to size. By the way, sorry for the really bad mix. I, I put no effort at all into doing anything here <laughs> other than just visualizing stuff. Okay, uh, this is this uh, partial ring. And I'll just wish through. So here is a spectral centroid mapped to brightness. And here you can see maybe there's something with the update rate here. So things that change quite rapidly maybe are not too, too good uh, here. Uh, the outline, I'm not sure whether you can see it. You can really see the uh, much higher centroid here than on the base or uh, and the drums change kind of, and, and actually, if if, uh, if you were would pay, be paying attention, <laughs> uh, you would see sort of the S's when when the the, the vocalist would um, would hit the S. And then let's see, oh, it's a similar one where we just fill out the whole space, so it's more or less uh, it's both size and this. Uh, the shape. Okay, so um, so we uh, handed this to uh, six experienced uh, audio engineers, uh, and the goal was to try to understand the potential drawbacks of each variation. Uh, each session took approximately forty-five minutes. Uh, they were asked to. Uh, explore and to try to achieve a good mix uh, and we we would actually we would uh, randomize uh, uh, when or what variation uh, was tried when uh, what we would actually also do was have them use longer time on the first couple of sessions uh, to get a feel for the interface in general and then when we began to change variations uh, the only difference there was was in the visualization, so it would be pretty fast to sort of get an understanding of what worked and what didn't work. Uh, we asked them to uh, think aloud, and then finally we had a discussion where they could sort of talk about the similarities or the differences between them. Uh, everything uh, was uh, uh, noted, sorted. These notes were sorted and, and coded uh, to show any any um, any patterns. So I'll just uh, summarize the results here. Um, so in general, these, uh, these visualizations were not used directly, um, which means that, um, I, I mean, this was not the goal that they were going to be used for these diagnost as a diagnostic tool, but, um, but more as sort of a, uh, something that would uh, accompany uh, 
the, the sound. Uh, it, generally, uh, they, uh, the visualizations provided a good sense of dynamics. So of course, uh, these don't show the dynamics, but once you uh, actually see them uh, and, and work with them, you can see the dynamics of things. Uh, somehow there was a different vibe than some of the other tests that we've made with this interface where suddenly people began to say, or these uh, participants began to say that this, was, this would be a really good tool for live mixing, which we haven't heard before, uh, probably because we've been missing this visualization. Because it's pretty fast to, uh, to see if something is, something is up. Uh, and also the, the, um, uh, the interface itself uh, everyone would say, well, it's really good for like a quick mix. But then when I have to go sort of into details with stuff, then I, then I get into problems. But for live uh, mixing, you'd pretty fast be able to get, uh, get somewhere. Um, yep, uh, visuals in generally supported uh, the audio. Uh, brightness uh, uh, was not liked. Uh, it drew too much attention. Uh, it was... Uh, unintuitive for the spectral centroid. For loudness, it was uh, it was intuitive enough, but uh, again, took too much attention away from what uh, the participants were doing at any given time. Uh, size uh, also drew um, maybe too much attention. Uh, um, there were comments that it might work with if it was less uh, dynamic. So if we would sort of average loudness over time, so it would be more sort of static uh, widgets that had uh, a size that wouldn't change as, as rapidly. Because it's this change in the visuals that, that uh, take, the, uh, take away the attention. Uh, size may also lead to clutter, which we don't want. Uh, the partial ring was uh, rated intuitive and um, and of course, it gave a sense of uh, how loud it was, uh, how loud the channel was compared to max loudness, right? So somehow there's a scale in, in, uh, in the partial ring you see at the top that you don't have in the other. However, uh, most of the participants, five out of six participants said that, that this was not information that they used. Um, so uh, they would, they would uh, rely on their ears instead. Uh, and the last one here, outline with noise, was the most favored. Uh, it was uh, subtle, uh, uh, subtle enough to not draw uh, away attention and intuitive. Maybe it was even too subtle. Uh, and there was discussions about is it even necessary to have this visualization of uh, spectral centroid frequency, um, which is a good question. I think. Uh, the, got to be careful with these visualizations and too much visual clutter, right? Because we want to essentially be able to listen to what we're doing, not see what we're doing. Uh, yeah, a little bit about the future. So again, is frequency visualization at a glance even useful? Um, uh, we'd like to maybe explore frequency visualization more as a diagnostic tool as well. Uh, so, for instance, it could identify whether there's some masking between uh, channels uh, and alert you if there's something that um, might be up there. We're exploring uh, dynamic uh, query filters, uh, which was uh, suggested by Mycroft and, uh, and colleagues. Uh, and uh, we've actually done a little bit of this already. Uh, where we have some sliders where you could actually set, uh, just show me those uh, channels that have a spectral centroid as above or below something. Uh, but just to test out whether they actually are useful in context, in a context. we think it's an interesting area. And uh, in terms of intelligent interfaces, uh, uh, probably what we would be looking at was not only uh, interfaces that would do the mix for you or parts of the mix or the tedious bits of the mix, but interface is kind of more like Google that learns your every need and your every desire. So I, probably I think gathering as much information and trying to sort of find some patterns in that that can help me next time I start a mix. I'll probably do something that's similar to what I did last time. So why not have the computer sort of just say, is this what you want? And then you go, ah, yes. I just uh, got rid of half an hour's work there setting everything up. OK. That's, uh, that's it. Come by for a demo uh, later.